this sport is, it is a breed test also. Yeah. It, it actually, um, you know, whether you like it or you don't like some parts of it, it actually, the actual training and how the dog handles the training getting up to the breed test, it's not about just a score. Mm -hmm. It's just how the dog has handled all the training to get to a certain level. That shows yeah. you, you know, what the animal is, what is in the genetics of the dog. It's beyond the phenotype now. You're actually now looking at the actual genetics of the dog. Vadim is the president of the United Shooks and Clubs of America, um, which is basically um, IPO, IGP. I want to get into all that, why, why the names have changed so many times. And, and it, I think it creates a lot of confusion. When I first got in the sport, it was, it was, it was IPO it had just changed from Schutzen. So um, tell me, Vadim, a little bit. You're the acting president. You've been the president for how many years now? Uh, I've been the president for three years. Three years. Um, tell me, first of all, before, before you tell me your background, and tell me a little bit about Schutzen USA, which is the USCA, United Schutzen Clubs of America, I believe it is, right? Yes, it's the United Shows and Clubs of America. Um, I think first and foremost, I think people hear the name United Shows and Clubs of America and they think of USCA as a, just a, a sport organization, but we're much more than that. Uh, we are uh, a full member of, of the working union of Schaefer Hund Brun, which is the WSV. Uh, we are a German Shepherd breed club, one of two in the United States of America. And uh, that, is, um, that is a big, big uh, uh, big thing uh, for us as an organization is sometimes we fight you know you know shoots an IPO IGP you know uh, alphabet soup there but uh, we are uh, we are first and foremost the German Shepherd breed club Okay, so let's talk about that, because I think that's the most important aspect of you know we know that Schutzen was was created for the German Shepherd dog and um, since you're a, it is a breed club, Tell me what that exactly means, because people think, oh, it's it's a it's a Schutzen club. It's a working dog club. It's where I go to get my dog titled. But there's more to it. And that's what I want to talk about and really get into today with you. Yes, it's it's also that. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> Schutzen, IPO, IGP, as it's known now and in other tests like herding test, HGH and and uh, various uh, uh, search and rescue titles. They are um, all breed titles. Now, there's a lot of people that do it as a hobby for sport, and that's awesome. You know, I was one of those people when I first started out. I didn't really comprehend the full gravity of what USCA is and our responsibility. Mm. But um, as I mentioned, we are a German Shepherd Breed Club, and those tests are very important in maintaining the working ability of the German Shepherd. That yeah, is how that... we determine... Go ahead, keep Sorry, going, because you know you're getting into something say, really important. So it's when, even before um, the working, uh, the World Union came out with breed harmonization, which is uh, basically criteria for um, breeding uh, German Shepherds. You know, what titles them, I said before, breeding, what health, what health, uh, what health certification they have to have before they can be bred. Um, that is how I look at Schutzen now. I mean, I love competing in, you know, as a sport with my dog, but as president of USCA, I have to look at it uh, in a in a more holistic way and what it means to the German Shepherd. So, so you're saying something that's important, and I mean, I, I really want to focus on this because I get so much guff from people. You know, I did a, a, a video on the German Shepherd dog, and the one thing I always hear from people is, "Oh my God, these German Shepherds—they're just bred like crap. They're all sloping backs. They all have hip and back problems. They all have all these issues." Um, and this is where you, the USCA really comes in to not not want this to happen. I mean, what, what is it as a breed club? What are those standards? and what's being overlooked by other organizations i don't want to mention any any names no 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 it's not it's not um all members of wsv if you're a member of the world union uh we passed unanimously at the general assembly the harmonization and the uh, breed criteria for the german shepherd so every german shepherd club every german shepherd club who's a member of the world union mm -hmm. has to abide by those uh criteria for breeding for what the dog is supposed to be, for health, before they can register a dog. Now, what the problem that you're bringing up is actually 
part of the reason why some of the litigations that people have heard about are ongoing. So the problem that you bring up is that there are many kennel clubs, um, members of the FCI kennel clubs, where dogs, breeding, registering dogs is about money. Right. It's not about what a German Shepherd should be. <laughs> Most of these clubs have no health criteria for breeding. They allow breeding brother to sister, mother to son, father to daughter, no hips, no elbows. And that is what you're talking about primarily. Mm -hmm. It's those, um, and, there, and, there, and there's a very large amount of uh, FCI clubs that, that are in this position. Okay, so let's, and for that people is who... where some of the, Oh, I want to dumb that the, down. The problems are arising, right? But but so FCI because this is it gets into an alphabet soup game for people who don't know yeah. this stuff. And, and I'm I'm one of them. I've learned a lot in talking to you and to some other people. But we start out with FCI, then we have the USCA, then we have AKC, then we have you know WUSV. If we want to kind of break this down, so people, the, not the average person, but the person who's getting into dog sports can have a better knowledge of it. How can we do this? Because what is FCI for people who don't know? So an FCI is the overarching umbrella who has uh, full members, which are typically members of national kennel clubs. It has contract partners uh, also, which is what the AKC is to the FCI. And a the AKC is not a member. It's a contract partner with the FCI. And okay. so is the Kennel Club of Britain. So is the Kennel Club of Britain. Uh, uh, the Canadian Kennel Club, and I forget, uh, one or two others. Okay. And then there's full members. And FCI full membership is every kennel club of a nation, so let's say of Italy, of France, of, of Russia, of Mexico, they have kennel clubs, and they belong to the FCI as this overarching umbrella organization. Okay. Is it just German Shepherds in WSD. the FCI? Huh? Is the FCI just German Shepherds? No, FCI is an all breed organization. It's, Got it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's an umbrella organization that encompasses kennel clubs like the AKC and, like I said, Mexican Canadian kennel clubs. So you have every breed. Got every it. breed. Okay, good. All right. So now we trickle down. So now we're coming down to yeah. the, the the other part, and, th and then let's talk about that. Okay. So the the World Union WUSV. Uh, is an organization that's uh, dedicated to the German Shepherd. We are a conglomeration of German Shepherd clubs throughout the world, some of whom are also members of kennel clubs. So, for instance, um, uh, uh, SAS in Italy is a member of ANCHI, which is the big kennel club. Um, and in the WSV, there's two types of members. There's those that are in the kennel clubs and those that are not in kennel clubs, which is what USCA is. We are what uh, we are outside of the kennel club organization structure. Okay. And Got then, it. similar similar to WSV, there's other organizations throughout the world dedicated to working breeds, like Rodwell Organization, which is the IFR, mm -hmm. uh, Doberman Organization, the Malinois Organization, which is the FMBB. So um, they're all de uh, organizations dedicated to working breeds and some of whom have contract agreements with the FCI also. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So the idea really, because the, the um, USCA is very is specific to only one breed, and that is the German Shepherd, the preservation of this breed. Correct. And what is stopping... Or, you know, or what's preventing this from really happening? Because the dogs that I've seen, a lot of German Shepherds are really amazing dogs. They're beautiful, they're healthy, their temperament is solid. But on the other side, I see German Shepherds that they're nerve bags, their health is crap, they're, they're, they're you know, they're, these, they're, they're very weak. I watch them when they walk and when they run and I get disgusted. Yeah, and it's, it's actually a problem that's not... Uh that's something very common throughout the world. And this is where um, the World Union of German Shepherds and uh, the FCI, I believe, had a falling out because the World Union is so dedicated to health of animals, certain health criteria that an animal must have, temperament testing and things like that. That is antithetical to what a kennel club would want because it would limit their registrations of German Shepherds. 
So if you think of all the German shepherds that are registered in the U.S. or Canada, which mm -hmm. is not a small number, mm -mm. a very small percentage of them have actually ever seen a Schutzen field. Mm -hmm. and why um, is that? And uh, it's, it's just not promoted by kennel clubs because uh, it, uh, you know, they would just rather register dogs, you know, like the Mexican Kennel Club or Brazilian Kennel Club. They just want to register dogs. That's all about money. Mm -hmm. And the more they check for health and lay out criteria for, uh, hey, you can't breed this dog unless it has at least passing hips and elbows, um, that limits their registrations. <laughs> right. It limits income. So, for example, so I that's know why you see, So that's why you see those animals, Robert, is because, uh -huh. you know, and I'm not saying that every, even every, every WSV member is perfect. Sure, we have our flaws, but sure. we don't have a big one like this. Well, we will literally register anything. <laughs> Well, it angers me. It really, it really pisses me off because, I mean, I think the German Shepherd is one of the most stoic, one of the most beautiful, one of the most, most important breeds of dogs there is, but they're just getting washed out and turning into just garbage, right? So what, I think, what, I, I think if, what, what, I think if what, you see, I think if you, go if ahead, you take you a go, sample sorry. of German Shepherds, I think if yeah. you take a sample of German Shepherds throughout the world, I think probably other than Germany and some European countries. And, and, you know, I think a very small percentage would actually fit the criteria that's set out by the World Union for what a German Shepherd should be, the breed standard itself, and the temperament testing and health testing that has to be done in order for it to be... A German Shepherd. Right. Well, can, yeah. give me an idea. What is this standard? Is it something that you can give me like three or five bullet points? This is what, what it should be? This uh, is... I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's actually, believe it or not, the standard actually is on the uh, on uh, USCA's website, and you know we can post the link. Or, or, I'm going or to whatever, but it's too it's too long it's too long to go into. But it specifies size, angulation, height. Um, but more importantly, uh, if you take a, a, a German Shepherd Club like ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, and this is something very interesting that's happening, uh, we've recently you know up, upgraded our uh, breed registry and. It's going to be really phenomenal, and the pedigree system is going to be very similar to what the SV puts out. There's, there's a very, um, very specific criteria for any member of WSV to register a dog that's okay. been bred, okay. and that includes, you know, health and temperament testing of the parents, um, in order to allow the dog to breed. That does not exist, like I just mentioned to you in. in a very large portion of the FCI. Actually, the ma big majority of the FCI, this does not exist. So all the big mm -hmm. kennel clubs around the world that you see, you can breed anything. Mm -hmm. and, and, that's, and everything that's has a paper, right? Everything gets a yep. certificate. Like you get an AKC paper from the, from the dog you bought it the, from, from the guy in the backyard. Exactly. Right. And, so, and so actually, is, and actually, uh, and, and, you know, I'm not going to, you know, like I'm not going to, you know, mention AKC, whatever, no. I'm just going to say kennel clubs. Yeah, for sure. Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of, AKC is not a member of the FCI, they're a contract partner. I'm there's actually that. members of the FCI, big kennel clubs, where uh, I, you could probably breed a yellow lab to a German Shepherd and register as a German Shepherd because, <laughs> just because. Right. I mean, because well, nobody, it's a $35 nobody's looking fee, for right? any kind of health certification. Nobody's looking for any kind of health certification, so. So if I want to breed, a dog, I know in Germany, in Germany, it's tough, right? If I'm going to breed a German Shepherd, someone's going to come knocking on my door from the SV and they're going to say, hey, what's going on? Let's see some papers, right? Exactly. So, so the SV maintains that, you know, I mean, that's one of the other things is DNA database. Mm -hmm. So the SV and, and now, you know, USCA, we've signed an agreement with the SV for DNA. So we, uh, when we register a dog, its DNA will be stored uh, in the repository at the SV. And we will always be able to trace lineage to DNA, and the SV can do that. So uh, in order to register a dog with the SV, even if it's foreign-born, you have to do a lot of legwork on DNA, hips, elbows, you know, temperament testing, and things like that. Otherwise, uh, you, know, you know, proof of lineage, and otherwise the SV won't register the dog. So they are very, very meticulous about which dogs they take and into the, the breed book. Is the USCA following that now? Is the USCA going along with that, doing the same stuff? That is correct. That is correct. We are, every WUSV member, including the USCA, is obligated to follow those breeding guidelines and breeding criteria. It's oh. not even, it's not even a question. You know, it's not, 
it's not uh, you know we're a nonprofit. It's not about uh, it's not about um, money or anything like that. It's about preserving the breed. <laughs> can, I mean, can it be rescued? Can can this be fixed? Because it's it looks like it's a disaster. Um, I think as long as we can maintain, um, you know, what we're kind of doing now in the WSB and we stay strong, mm -hmm. you know, I think you're gonna sa you're gonna save some, mm -hmm. but it, it's almost like. Uh, you know, sometimes I feel like, uh, you know, we're drinking out of a fire hose because <laughs> German shepherds that get produced throughout the world. Yeah, German shepherds that get produced throughout the world outside of the WSV sphere and within the National Kennel Club organizations who are FCI members, you know, outnumber the German shepherds that are produced within this proper breeding uh, criteria. Mm -hmm. So, so just so it's not a confusion, I want to make sure people understand who are watching this. I'm sure there's a lot of people who practice the sports who are practicing who probably would say, oh, of course, I only want this kind of dog. But what about people who just want to get a pet? They just want a German Shepherd dog and because it, it is an amazing dog. It's great temperament. I mean, isn't it as important or maybe even more important for somebody who just wants a pet to say, this dog better have the right temperament and the right breeding before I bring him into my home with my kids and, and my neighbors? I think I think you know I think if you look at uh, if you look at uh, the way that the the Schutzen world used to be 20 30 years ago mm -hmm. um, versus today I think a lot of working dogs today are actually pets hmm. whereas before they were more you know in the kennel or you know whatever you know had the working dog's life yeah. but I think uh, I think now I think now more than ever even the dogs that we produce you know within the organization of course you're going to have some outliers but they are you know, first and foremost, loyal companions. Yeah. It doesn't but matter it's... if they're, it, it, it doesn't, it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't matter if they're, uh, you know, some kind of a, uh, you know, uh, uh, a beastly dog on the field and dominating the helper and, you know, just, you know, looking very powerful or whatever. They're still supposed to be a loyal companion. And first isn't and that, foremost, to you and isn't that part of the breed standard? Where it, that the is part can, of the beast, yeah. right? Okay, so it's yeah. a beast in the yeah. field. It tears. It just goes in. It, it's got a nice fight drive, nice defensive drive. But at home, it's it's nice with my kids. It's not going to kill my kids. It's not going to bite my my wife's face off, right? Exactly. I mean, that's that's the that's the ideal. But of course, you know, if you take a sample of the population of a human population too, never right. mind German shepherds, you're going to get all kinds of people. You know. Yeah. So you get all kinds of dogs too. So, but I'm hoping. I'm hope I'm hopeful that you know responsible breeders, and I'm not I'm not a breeder, so but I'm hopeful that breeders look at all of that, and they just don't look at the highlight of illness, and they look at the overall temperament of the dog, and yeah. they breed those nice dogs. <laughs> I mean, is there a balance between? I mean, in German shepherds like Malinois. I mean, I see them where they're show line, they're working line, but they can be a combination of these two. Can it be a really nice looking German shepherd and have a nice temperament and just be a really good dog? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a lot of and there's a lot of breeders all over the world that do breed that. But uh, I, I, and it's not a but. And um, a German shepherd is, uh, you know, as I mentioned, a loyal companion, but it's also a working dog. Mm -hmm. So it has to be able to naturally exhibit those working traits. So I want to touch on a couple of things that you've done that, that are very important. Um, and I mean, it's, I, it's in my opinion, it's rare to see somebody who's the head of an organization who really has this caring and isn't just doing it for an ego position. Um, talk to me about this, the, the, the entire, not maybe the entire, but the litigation that went on with the FCI from the USCA to the FCI. What was the root of it? Because I know there's been a lot of conversation if we want to call it that back and forth okay uh so um i i mentioned it earlier in our interview robert is that there's basically this um it's a it's a it's a it's a type of relationship between the wsv and the fci that are sometimes incompatible to each other mm -hmm. and meaning that if you enforce, if a kennel club enforces the WSV breed standard and what it takes to breed a German Shepherd and allow it to breed, they will lose money. Because in most kennel clubs, German Shepherd could be two, that could be number two or three or four, you know, in terms of numbers and breedings, you know, other than, you know, Labrador Retriever or some breed like that. Right. But German Shepherds is all, are always up there in terms of numbers. 
So if you put this criteria in place where German Shepherd has to have a working title, has to have passing hips and elbows, has to have a certain you know, breed quality, um, you will limit severely the income stream for these FCI kennel clubs. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the, you know, that's part of the problem and what happened between WSV and FCI. The second one is that associations like FCI and members that belong to the FCI, like the, the Vada Ha, which is the mm -hmm. German Kennel Club, people know it as BDH, mm -hmm. they don't believe whether it's out of uh, just not knowing or arrogance, I don't know, but they don't believe that uh, competition law applies to them. And for instance, so FCI is a monopoly when it comes to export pedigrees. They pretty much control 100% of the export pedigree market, which means the trade of dogs mm -hmm. around the world. Wow. So it's not illegal to be a monopoly. Right. What is illegal <laughs> is abusing the monopoly power. Mm -hmm. So what happened was the FCI and WSB used to have an agreement and everybody coexisted similar to how the FCI has an agreement with the Rockwell organization or the Boxer organization. And then the agreement due to some personal conflicts um, basically was canceled by the General Assembly of the FCI. And the criteria for entering into a new agreement, one of the big criteria is that they wanted all the dissident clubs like US, USCA and our sisters or sister organization in Canada, GSSCC Canada and Real CEPA in Spain. And there's, there's about, there's uh, over 20 of us. They wanted us to either go away in our entirety or join the kennel clubs. Now, for a lot of us, joining the kennel club is not possible because it's a diametric uh, opposition to what we are to the German Shepherd and what we enforce for the breed standard and mm -hmm. breeding practices. You can't be a member of a kennel club and enforce these breeding regulations. And frankly, the kennel clubs don't want many of us. Mm -hmm. Why do you think so that is? It was be kind of, because you're so strict? It was kind of like, or, or they already have German Shepherd organizations in the kennel club, and most of them do. Uh -huh. Actually, yeah, I think all of them do. And there's just so much, uh, conflict that's been going on between the two organizations that they couldn't coexist. Now, that's not the case with us in uh, in the United States of America. We get along pretty well with GSDCA. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relationship based on mutual respect, but that's not necessarily the case in other countries. Mm -hmm. So in other countries, these organizations just can't coexist because the organization who is a member of a kennel club wants to adhere to kennel club standards and won't necessarily adhere to WSV standards. Mm -hmm. So it's just not compatible at all. And frankly, a kennel club can only have one breed organization per breed. So it wasn't possible for us. So then in abusing its monopoly power, what the FCI decided to do was basically kill uh, dissident club, what I'll call dissident clubs, which is a club, uh, German Shepherd clubs who were not members of the FCI. So how did they try to do that? In 2019, um, just before Christmas, uh, they basically put out uh, um, uh, an edict that no FCI judges can go judge outside of the FCI. <laughs> Which means that, I mean, think about why you would do that. Why would you, mm -hmm. why would you do that? What, what is going through your mind when you do that? It, nothing good. Tyranny. So, yeah, it's basically, it's abuse of monopoly power. Mm-hmm. And then, so what happened was um, all the all the invitations we had for judges to come from the SV to judge here or from any other country, uh, all of a sudden, all the invitations got rescinded. You know, I mean, uh, all the permissions got rescinded because the right. FCI said that an FCI judge can't judge outside the FCI. Well, um, that's when uh, myself and uh, Rodrigo Capozano got together and we uh, hired the best uh, um the best uh, uh, competition uh, law uh, law firm we could in Germany, uh, Gleis Lutz, and uh, they have been phenomenal because they are competition law experts. And from day one, from day one, we have won every substantive battle in court against the uh, VDH and against the FCI. So wow. the fight is still going. 
but the fight has moved now from judges, which is uh, already cemented in stone. That's a that's a done deal. That can never happen again because that's a, that was a violation of competition law. So the courts ruled, uh, and it was a very decisive ruling that basically judges are free to judge wherever they they want. Right. Um, and then so now we're uh, now we're in a uh, kind of like this big final fight for pedigrees. And I'll tell you why, uh, how, in, how, how even bizarre that is, that we're fighting the, at the, for the fact that, let's say, USCA can certify a pedigree or issue an export pedigree. So let me give you an example. I could buy a German Shepherd, male and female, from the president of the FCI, let's say. And this female comes to me and he, he, he bred those two dogs together and the female comes to me pregnant, okay? Comes mm -hmm. to the United States pregnant. I just bought these two animals from the president of the FCI with FCI pedigrees. And he certifies the breed. This dog comes here, has puppies. If I issue pedigrees to these puppies, that same person will no longer recognize those dogs. <laughs> that sounds because stupid. they were issued because they were issued outside of their monopoly network. Wow. Yeah, that's that's so that's 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 where we're at right now. There's no there's no logical way to look at it mm -hmm. because everybody knows that. Uh, WSV members have a much stricter criteria for dog registration and for breeding. It's just, um, it's just a big, uh, it's a big, uh, it's all about money. <laughs> yeah. How do we change that? How do we make it? I mean, because look, ethically, anybody who buys a dog or, or anybody who's really, who loves the breed is more interested in the prolonging of the breed, the health of the breed, the temperament of the breed than the registration money. But but there's it seems like it's like a kind of vicious circle where they're kind of pulled into the root of it by kennel clubs or work organizations like the FCI. But how does how do you break that? How do you break that circle? The, the only way to break that circle is from the top down. I mean, you, you know, I am all for free market functioning the way the free market should, which is you are free to go to any responsible, you know, organization and, and do whatever you want register a dog if they're if they're you know if they're if they're obviously if they're you know, if they have a system for that i mean which all wsv members should mm -hmm. but um i'm so I, I i never blame anybody who's on the consumer side because i want the most for the consumers sure and that is what we're fighting for mm -hmm. i actually you know i was i had a conversation with rodrigo uh my counterpart in spain a couple of months ago and I said, do you realize how insane it is? I said, we're actually fighting for normal. We're yeah. not fighting for anything special. We're just fighting for normal. And you're not fighting to make more money. You're actually fighting for less monetary gains and more health gains for the breed. I, I'm, I'm Robert. I mean, realistically, is it will it mean, uh, you know, more money for USCA? It probably would. And I don't know really how much, but I'm, that's yeah. not what I'm fighting for. No, I know that. That's my point. Now, what's going on between the AWDF and USCA? Really, nothing. Okay. Um, I think I think uh, AWDF is kind of on its own path, and you know USCA is on its own path. And okay. I uh, I had a I had a conversation with uh, uh, with a with a person I'm not going to mention the name. Uh, no, don't. Uh, recently, who is not who's not uh, who's not uh, in any position of authority within the AWDF. And they asked me uh, flat out, they said, you know, would you recognize AWDF titles if AWDF recognizes USCA titles? And I said, of course. So that seems fair. Because it gives maximum opportunities for everybody in USA. And this world is already small enough. Mm -hmm. We don't need to limit these opportunities. And most people, you know, 90, 99% of people that trial out there just want to go have fun with their club members, uh, enjoy, you know, enjoy, enjoy the atmosphere, train their dog. And, and, but, you know, we we get into this alphabet soup, and again, it comes down to personalities and what people want and don't want. But I'm I'm telling you emphatically on on this podcast that I will I have absolutely zero zero problem recognizing right. anybody that recognizes us. So the AWDF do was there an issue where they didn't recognize USCA titles? 
So, so what, so what happened is because we're in this fight, uh, if mm -hmm. we're outside of the FCI umbrella, mm -hmm. um, the, AW, the AWDF chooses not to recognize USCA titles, even though um, our AKC sister organization recognizes our titles and SV Germany recognizes our titles. But it, it you know, it's entirely up to them. It's, you know, I'm just, you know, you asked me a question about mm -hmm. AWDF. I mean, our relationship is, you know, I haven't talked to anybody at AWDF okay, yeah. in a while. I talked to some. I talked to some people who are, you know, presidents of various breed clubs or vice presidents or other positions in breed clubs, and like I told you, somebody asked me flat out about th three, four weeks ago if you know we would recognize everything, and I said, yeah, but I'm not going to live on a one-way street where we do and you right. know, it's AWDF be mutual. doesn't. I yeah, be mutual. I think that's the only that's the only way, way any productive relationship works. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, are, are USCA pedigrees recognized outside of the USCA? Yes, they our, are. Uh, our, pedigree, uh, our pedigrees are recognized by the SV and they are uh, in accordance with WSV statutes and bylaws. They will they are recognized by all WSV members. OK, and I would think that would be a, 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 a leg up for a German Shepherd to, to be recognized by the USCA because it would be higher standards than what we would go through if we were with just a regular kennel club. I think so too. I think so too. And I actually, um, one of the documents I presented in court was um, in Germany was uh, on my dog, and my dog, you know, is registered with the kennel club, mm -hmm. and is also my dog is also registered with USCA, and I showed a USCA pedigree versus what a kennel club pedigree has, and his kennel club pedigree literally had nothing on his parents, his grandparents in terms of health, what they look like, what they were, whereas you know our pedigree is more complete, more like the SV style pedigree where it has you know, the complete, you know, hips, elbow record and, and you know, various other information on uh, show ratings on the dog. And uh, it's just not a thing for a lot of kennel clubs. It is for some, but for yeah. many, it is not. Well, I'd like to do um, two Vedimas. I'd like to get some just a sample and show the difference. Maybe put it on the screen here. Um, what this pedigree looks like and how thorough for people who haven't seen an SV pedigree what that should really look like, what you should really be able to see in it because of all the stamps and stuff like that, that really, I mean, you're checking the teeth, the eyes, the, the, the hips, the elbows. The, I mean, you're going through the entire exactly. dog, right? And, On, and, the, and their parents and grandparents. Right, and, and that's beyond. key, right? Yeah. So I can look at your or my, my, my female's grandparents or great grandparents and see where were their hips, where were their, where were their elbows, what, what was their everything, right? I mean, all this and what they yep. had and, and, I want to talk about this for a second. I've got a Malinois. I've got a German Shepherd. Now, my Malinois got a show title. He's a champion in AKC stuff. But I have an issue with something, and that is that in so many of these kennel clubs, a dog can be a champion and be seen as this amazing dog. And then you look at their titles underneath, and you might see a rally novice and a canine good citizen. But we haven't shown the working ability of a dog. So if the dog is a herding dog, it's a border collie, it's a Malinois, it's something, it should have a working title, you know, some kind of a working title, because that, in and of its sense, shows the, the real temperament of the dog. Is the dog able to do the work that it was originally bred to do? Who cares if it looks like it should look, which is nice when it does, but isn't that, at the crux of the issue, what you're fighting for is that this is the most important part of this dog, that it has the temperament to be able to do what it can do and do it well. We are, uh, all of WSV is fighting for that, for the German Shepherd. And I know mm -hmm. just from reading some of the uh, internal reports of other organizations, uh, you know, other working organizations are fighting for that too. But like, mm -hmm. I, like I mentioned, Robert, you're drinking up, you know, like, you know, it's basically a fire hose being poured yeah. on you. So you want all of these things and then the kennel club you belong to doesn't care about them. So yeah. um, now you're up. So now you're up against uh, why should I spend all this time and effort to go and, you know, do a, sh a show rating for my dog and then to get a working titles when my neighbor's got, you know, a Malinois or a German Shepherd and they can just register them with a the kennel right. club and have puppies and issue papers and sell puppies and nobody cares. Yeah. Well, let's so, talk about that. How, yeah, how, it, does, how, how does all this affect handlers worldwide and as well as here in the USA? They really have to do their homework. They really, right. I mean, it all comes down to responsible breeding. Right. And, you know, handlers should, you know, handlers should use as many uh, resources 
whether they're online personal resources that are available to them. But you know, you you kind of you kind of you know indirectly um, nailed it, and because the FCI is, is a monopoly mm-hmm. when it comes to the export of dogs and you know the kennel clubs and all of that is the registration of dogs. A large portion of FCI revenue comes from exactly the test that you mentioned. So it's like I can't remember the exact number, but between it's between seventy and eighty percent of their revenue comes from phenotype shows. Mm-hmm. You know the the type of shows that you're talking about, where you know how close does the dog look to the breed standard? You know the coat, the angles, the height, uh, the size. You know everything it has nothing to do with working ability. Mm-hmm. And that is uh, more than three quarters, I want to say, of FCI income is those shows. Mm-hmm. Now, but how much how much of FCI income actually comes from IGP or Schutzen, you know, whatever people want to, uh, you know, uh, refer to it as? Mm-hmm. Um, I believe it's under 3%. 3%? three percent. Three percent? Three percent, under three percent. Yeah. Wow. Okay, but just a so, second. I'm, I'm, I'm veering off topic here for a second because this is important. You yeah. said the phenotype show, which I think is it's nice. But I, I, I looked into German Shepherds just because of my passion of mine being, being half German. I don't see the German Shepherds in size, angulation, and, and many other characteristics looking like the breed standards that I saw 40 years ago. Yep. No, you're absolutely right, and that's the evolution. Mm-hmm. That was one of the two, and I don't, you know, you'll have to, um, you'll have to just uh, pardon my ignorance. It's when the breed split from, you know, just being the German Shepherd working dog to, you know, the show line and then the working line. So when we had that split in the breed, mm-hmm. is what you're talking about, really, because before that, um, all dogs were classified in the same category, and now, okay, you know, it's. Now it's very, you know, like, I mean, you know, like excellent select the VA rating for a German Shepherd, it would, it's, it's almost, it's almost impossible, if not completely impossible for a working line dog to obtain a VA rating, you know, wow. because those, yeah, but, but even those dogs, even those dogs, nobody might say, wow, look at how powerful they are on the field mm. uh, or, or something like that. You know, their bite work is not, you know, great or whatever, and their mm-hmm. obedience is not flashy. Even those dogs still have to go through temperament testing, health right. classification and certification, and they have to get a working title yeah. to be bred. Okay. So let's talk about the temperament test, because it's to me the most, always the best thing about a dog is the dog's temperament. I like a nice looking dog, but for me, it's all about temperament. I mean, I want my dog to be safe around kids and other animals and people and bicycles and, you know, and, and in a city environment or a country environment. Talk about the temperament test that we put on a German Shepherd, and I've done it with both of my dogs. Um, what it is, just to, and it, it can just be a nutshell. It doesn't have to be the exact thing, but tell people who don't know, because there might be a couple people listening who, who have never known what is the temperament test for a German Shepherd in, in the USCA. So, so the, the very first test, of course, is uh, the BH, you know, which is a, which is a, which is a, just a temperament test. It's a very mm-hmm. novice level where you demonstrate the dog's obedience, and the dog's uh, um, you evaluate a judge evaluates the dog, uh, how it acts around cars, bicycle, you know, being exposed to strangers, uh, another strange dog, or or dog, you know, a neutral dog, mm-hmm. and just to simulate, you know, it's an artificial simulation of uh, of life. Mm-hmm for lack of a better word. So when you tie a dog out, you know, and a neutral dog walks by or you tuck a dog, t- tie a dog out and the handler walks out of sight, it's something to simulate you leaving your dog outside the supermarket or something like that while you go in and get your groceries or something like that. And a well-bred, you know, German Shepherd should be able to handle that without, uh, you know, needing its mommy or its daddy. Mm-hmm. So and that's it's... just, that's a very beginner, you know, level where you, you have to do some basic obedience, you know, healing, you know, some in motion exercises, recall to make sure the dog comes to you, you know, very basic levels of obedience. And then uh, what we call the traffic portion of the test where, you know, car, bike, jogger, neutral dog, um, and then just how it interacts with people. And so that's the very first. Then that's just temperament. That's just basically there's no working in there. There's no biting. There's no nothing in this level. There's nothing except some what I'll call basic obedience. Right. 
Right. And this is a good test that I think, I mean, I think it goes beyond the canine good citizen, which is, I think, what the AKC tried to kind of meld into their thing, which is, I still think, a, ni- a very, very nice thing for people to do with their dogs. But yep. the BH can be done by anybody. I mean, Frank was telling me, Frank Phillips, who's on the show, he's your friend as well, um, said that he did it on a Yorkshire Terrier. You know? yep. <laughs> um, but what a great thing if there's a club in your area to take your dog and to show that it, it has a good temperament, right? It doesn't have to just be a German Shepherd. But here we're talking more about the German Shepherd. Yeah, and and, we, and and as I said, you know, we're a German Shepherd Club, but USCA has always been welcoming to all other breeds, mm-hmm. uh, at least in, in, in my in my history, you know, everybody's welcome. If you got a Yorkie and you want to do a BH, no problem. Right. You know, or, you know, we, you know, I've seen, I've seen, you know, I've seen Labradors, I've seen many other breeds, you know, doing, you know, certain things and, you know, uh, certain parts of Schutzen and they can't do other parts of Schutzen, you know, because some dogs just can't bite necessarily or so they can well, do the uh, can't, can't an obedience the title, they can do an obedience title or, yeah, they can do obedience title <laughs> or tracking title or. Right. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, you right. can't you can't get a Yorkie or a one meter jump now. Well, you you can get him over, but he can't get over on his own. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, okay, so th- now let's talk about the temperament of of the um, if we're if we're gonna have a dog, a German Shepherd, without going to the IPO one, two, or three. What is the other working title that the dog gets? The the more show line dogs go through. Yeah, so so I I've never done one myself, but there is like a there's a zap test which is uh, supposed to simulate, also in a way real life, you know where, um, you know how the dog responds to certain stimuli, you know if something pumping out of the bushes, noises, walking across unstable surfaces or being on unstable surfaces, things like that. Um, so I've never done one myself, and uh, that uh, you know due to due to COVID. Um, a lot of the ZAP training hasn't been able to be proliferated by the SV throughout the world to all the WSV members. So when uh, the, the floodgates open up on travel again, you know, we will start getting our judges up to speed on ZAP. But that is one other test that was implemented. And it's kind of a based on some things that are done around the European Union. And some of them have a lot of validity because, um, you know, it's basically, you know, how does the dog respond to a surprise, something popping out, you know, from the woods type of thing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, what you find out, because I'm also a judge, you find out that people can train for anything. Sure. And our job as a judge, especially when something is used for a breed test or, you know, like, you know, like that's your first breeding title where, you, you know, once you get that, you're allowed to breed your dog. It's up to us as judges to be able to tell you know, um, natural behavior versus trained. Right. Yeah. So if you're going to do a cruel. test like that, yeah, so if you're going to do a test like Zap, what you really want to see is uh, genetics. You know, right. you want to see the you want to see the genetics of the dog. You know, I don't want to see the dog trained. You know, like hey, you know, we're going to go this into the woods and something's going to pop out and you're going to be mm-hmm. fine. You know, right? So you really just want to see that. Yeah, and that, that's where judges play a very important role, and that's. You know, when when you get, I think when judges start to get trained in ZAP, I think it's a very important distinction to make is to be able to identify what is in true heart of of the dog, of the German Shepherd, and then what is the actual training for tests like that, for, you know, for an environmental soundness test like that. So this is a new thing, the ZAP thing that you're talking about, right? The ZAP test. Yes, it's a new thing. And I'll send you, and I'll send you just some basic criteria, you know, like we talk about, I'll send you pedigrees that you can put up and I'll send you some basic criteria of what is allowed to breed a dog. You know, okay, but we breed and that. register a German Shepherd. Okay, but how do we assure that that, like, I know it's for the best of the breed and I know it's for the best, not only of the dogs, but the people who are gonna have these dogs, but how can we get this word out there? How can we make this more, I mean, common that, that people know that like, how do you prevent somebody from taking the, my, oh, I got a German Shepherd. You got a dog who looks kind of like a German Shepherd. Why don't we uh, breed them together, make some puppies and sell them for 200 bucks a piece? How do we make it like a stigma that people don't do that, that they try to do the right thing? Because it's obviously for the benefit of the dog and the, and the, and the I people. Think, I think people, you know, Robert, it's a, it's a difficult one because no matter what dog you got, you can have the, you know, you can have the most uh, not, German Shepherd looking German Shepherd, but uh, it's still love. It's still loved by by you know that person. They're like, oh, I love this dog so much. I want to breed him. You know, I want to have puppies from this dog. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know how to stop that. I don't. I don't think it's even possible. I, I I only ask, and you know, we can only do what we can do, which is you know, act 
in accordance with WSV, what we passed in the General mm -hmm. Assembly, which is we as WSV member will not register this dog, not issue this dog papers unless it has passed certain health and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, and other working criteria. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I can't make the FCI implement the same thing in the kennel clubs around the world because they would yeah. lose a ton of income. Right. Ton. Well, their income is based not on, on how good the dogs are registered, but how many of whatever said dogs are registered. Yep. Yep. Right? Take number of dogs, take number of dogs, multiply by how many pedigrees they issue, how many puppy certificates they issue. You know, that's, that's where the income come from. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think there's also some income obviously from, you know, sporting events like agility and, you know, sure. dog dancing and whatever, whatever else. But the bulk of the income in any kennel club is registrations and yeah. pedigrees. Yeah. What do so you if see? So you start to limit, if, if you start to limit that, you start to limit, you know, their, their cash flow. <laughs> but wouldn't you think that like an organization, I'm not going to say it again, I'm not going to pick names, but don't you think, wouldn't no. we think that an organization would want to be for the betterment of, I mean, they all scream for the betterment of the breed. I mean, I don't know if you watched the, the uh, Westminster show, oh, yeah. show, the dog that won. Um, I, I didn't watch this year's Westminster show. Sometimes I get glimpses of it, but it's just not my, uh, you know, it's kind of cool, but I don't, I don't really, it's not my thing. Although I, I do have a, I do have I, I, full disclosure. I love miniature pinchers and I, uh, <laughs> I, right. uh, you know, we, we used to have a couple and I still want some, yeah. but, uh, um, I also, I also have a yellow lab, mm -hmm. uh, well, so we I like to lab. watch it, but I still, but even my, even the mint pins we had, even though I didn't train them to do anything except mm -hmm. eat and sleep, you know, even <laughs> they, if you let them out, they would hunt squirrels or hunt chipmunks right. or something like that. Just to see the instinct in the dog. So. Yeah. Well, this same thing carries through our conversation really carries through into other breeds. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Labradors I mean, we have a hunting Labrador and we have a dog that was a career change guide dog. And you watch a nice hunting Labrador, you know, we've got British line lab. It's just a, it's poetry in motion to watch an animal do what they were really bred to do. And, you know, and, and all the non-sporting dogs or all the, you know, the, the toy dogs, all, all those really have kind of fallen in because people just want a pet. But even a dog that's well suited for a sport, whether it's IPO or you know Schutzen or, or or hunting, yep. they're still amazing pets, and sometimes they're better pets because they have that temperament, they have that ability to know I'm working or I'm not working, and that that's so critical. It's you know it's um it's a it's a it's a gift sometimes you know if you have a high power let's say Malinois or high power German Shepherd dog, it's it's a blessing when they have an off switch. Mm -hmm. When you can actually bring the dog in the house and they can chill with you on the couch, you know, because, you know, the reality is some just can't because, you know, because of breeding or whatever other reasons, you know, they're such high drive animals that they have to do something all the time. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, dogs with an off switch, of course, you know, working dogs with an off switch that operate within the family environment and, you know, can hang out and chill and watch TV with the kids or whatever. They're they're awesome. I yeah, love there's that. nothing better. Nothing better. Yeah. So with, yep. let's go back to the USCA thing. Cause, so what's your plans for the future? You've been a president for three years. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people who know you and a lot of people who don't know you directly, but who know what you've done, which is why I wanted to get you on the show. What's your mission? What's, what's next? And what do you see as the, the final outcome of all these lawsuits when all is said and done? Well, there's really not many lawsuits anymore uh, internationally, but that was a big one, you know, because that was... The first one in 2019, when we, when Rodrigo and myself and uh, and uh, 13 other countries uh, filed the lawsuit in Germany against uh, the VDH and you know, which is basically was the you know they're the German Kennel Club who was part of the FCI. Um, that was us fighting for our existence. Okay, so that was an existential fight that um, if we lost, I'm not sure what USCA would have been. Or if it even would have been, because they basically what the FCI decided to do is abuse their monopoly power, and eliminate all SV judges from going to, you know, these dissident clubs like ourselves, like the Canadian uh, WSV member, like the Spanish WSV member. So they were basically cutting off our line to Germany hmm. of judges. So um, after we won that fight, and that has been cemented now in legal. <laughs> In legal language for posterity, you know that was probably my biggest um, 
um, I, 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 I don't even want to say it's, it's an accomplishment. It was just like a biggest thing that I've done, you know, I think for the organization other than, you know, just trying to, you know, trying to be a good representative of USA and WSV and, you know, getting us kind of at the top, you know, where we have, you know, where we as an organization, even though we're not a member of a kennel club, have all, have say in preservation of our breed because we are so focused and so, you know, um, have, we have a lot of energy and a lot of focus on the actual, you know, the, the breed standard on the actual working ability of the dog. I mean, it's in our name. Mm -hmm. You know, we're known as Schutz in USA. Yeah. So, but that 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 fight that fight that actually was dropped another not doorstep, but then, you know, you can you know that fight was a very important win for for us, and that 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 is something that um, that I take a lot of pride in because. Um, it's not like it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant being in court. It's not pleasant sitting in you know law firm offices, no matter how nice they are, talking mm -hmm. about you know suing someone or you know, you know I'd rather exist in a world where we all get along and everybody benefits from you know, and gets you know and and gets their accomplishments done. But that unfortunately is not the world we were living in. We were living in a world where somebody wanted to destroy every organization that wasn't a member of their uh, umbrella. What gave you the balls to do this? Like, how did you get it inside your head to go, I'm going up against one of the biggest organizations in the world. I'm going to do this. And USCA is maybe a big organization here, but in the scope of the world, is it that big? Is it that powerful? I mean, like, how did you, um, uh, it's, it's like, it's, it really is I mean, a Dave and Goliath story, isn't it? Uh, in some way, in some ways it is. And, you know, the fight is still going, but now the fights turn to, you know, pedigrees and things like that. You know, just, you know, for the normal existence. But uh, I guess for me personally, I mean, most of my professional career, I worked for, um, you know, Department of Defense in some way or another. Most of the time, uh, uh, most of the time it was for the guys that were on the front lines, whether it was, um, you know, uh, you know um, guys that did special missions and things like that. So even when I had my own company, you know, I was uh, very much involved with that whole, you know, front tip of the spear mentality mm -hmm. and I think it's just you know that's just in me ingrained in me because I, I don't you know I wouldn't back away from a you know a, from a fight especially when somebody is trying to destroy your family mm -hmm. and it's a really amazing and, story you know, and I and and I had you know you know and you know life's been good to me and I worked hard for it um, you know and I had the means to 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 do it um, so uh, yeah uh, we went and got the best law firm in Germany, in my opinion, when it comes to competition law. And uh, they really did a phenomenal job and are still doing a phenomenal job. Did you, did you know you'd win? Did you, knew you, did you think, okay, I'm doing this, it's the right so, thing to do, or did you go, I'm going to win it? So sometimes, you know, sometimes when you go to court, it's a flip of a coin. For sure. Um, but but uh, when, when the violations are so blatant, and there's so much legal precedent behind it. I mean, there's always doubt in your mind when you end up in court. And German court is actually, you know, being in German court was actually very cool. It's very different from the U.S. court. It's a lot less formal, you mm -hmm. know, with the judge asks questions, of people sitting there and things like that. Of course, they, they, you know, they get the arguments, but it's, 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 it was actually interesting. Um, but um, it's, I, I would say, you know, I, I believed that we would win, but you never know for sure, of course, but there was just so much legal precedent, so much, you know, where, you know, this wrestling organization try to prevent judges from going to this other wrestling organization or, uh, you know, the soccer organizations, FIFA and FIBA, you know, the fighting and, you know, how they, you know, how they treat athletes. So there's so much legal precedent for that. And the other thing is, and I think I mentioned it earlier, you know, the associations like the BDH, which is the German Kennel Club, the CI, which is the overarching umbrella, you know, they've operated a certain way forever. Mm -hmm. And nobody's really challenged them. And there's such ignorance of actual competition law um, that they don't believe it applies to them because they're an association. But really, but really, competition law applies to everybody, especially mm -hmm. when you're a monopoly. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're a business, whether they want to believe it or not. And just because... And just because, you know, this is, you know, this was one of the defenses. Well, this is in our, in our association bylaws, so we can do it. 
And the judge will say, <laughs> well, no, it's against, it's against European law. Right. <laughs> Your bylaws are against the law. It doesn't matter what's in your association. It doesn't matter what's your association document, you know, right. it's your statutes. You know, change it. Now you have to change it. So that was part, also part of the ruling is that their whole, you know, some, some of the statutes that the VDH had in their, you know, in their, in, you know, forming internal documents were against competition law. So they had to change it. Do they love, do they love you or what? No, I don't. You know what? I don't, I don't actually have, I don't have hate in my heart for anybody. To tell you honestly, I don't have hate yeah. in my heart for anybody. I wish, I just wish for a normal world. And that's the, you know, that's what I told you. Like, it was funny that Rodrigo and I are like, I'm fighting and you're fighting for normal. We're mm -hmm. not fighting for special, just right. normal. Yeah. It seems like it's and, kind and, of a, a microcosm. And that example I gave you of me purchasing a, 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 a female who is pregnant from the president of the FCI or, you know, yeah. the, the general secretary of the FCI with FCI papers, and she's coming in here pregnant. They know it's pregnant, and they know the history of the dog. They have the DNA to prove it and all the stuff. And then the puppies are born here, and they would never recognize the pedigree I give to these puppies, which is insane. <laughs> Completely insane. insane. Completely insane. Even though I could prove it with DNA. Right, right, right. But that's what's so, that, yeah, again, but that's in their, um, that's in their outline, right? That's in their law. Files. That's that's you know what, uh, yeah, and and you know and, and things like that, especially, especially when it comes to like you know what I you know I don't want to you know just like uh, uh, say it to to diminish it like when it comes to like sale you know international trade of dogs of any animals for that matter, you know we're now in the uh, in that part of it which is you know which is making which is making a lot of uh, competition authorities of countries where these kennel clubs operate now stand up and take notice because there's actually been a couple of recent uh, legal uh, undertakings by s some competition authorities of countries against uh, kennel clubs or you know this is not a this is not a thing you mess with okay I go to court with with them you know Vadim USCA Real Sepa Rodrigo okay that's one thing and you know we might win some we might you know, we might split this decision, that decision. When the government comes after you, you're talking mm -hmm. somebody with unlimited resources, right? <laughs> and unlimited resources to le and unlimited resources to levy fines. Mm -hmm. Do you, Do you think that with the and work you did, do you think this lawsuit that you filed and and Rodrigo, I mean, your your group lawsuit, actually has opened the doors for other organizations around the world to do the same thing to the FCI to, to open it up to make it more fair? I, 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 I think actually what's going to happen and my hope of what happens is nobody else will have to do this. <laughs> that this will Love be that. done. A legal right. precedent will be set um, where clubs operate in accordance with competition law and in a lawful way and nobody else will have to do it. So right. um, that that's actually my hope because you know, legal precedent, you know, I, you can't stop somebody from doing somebody something illegal. Right. So if somebody wants to do something illegal, they could try. And sure. it always takes somebody to stand up and take them to court, you know, especially in this case. But usually, you know, at the level we're at now, we're basically at the highest court in Dusseldorf, Germany, with the FCI and the VDH right now. There's no court higher than that. Wow. After, the, after that decision, that, that's like the Supreme Court decision, you know. When is and that coming down? When is that coming down? When will we know? Uh, part of it is actually uh, there's a hearing on June 30th, so you should know within the month after that hearing on on a part of it. Uh, and then the next part is in July, August. But uh, there's a big one in June 30th, actually. Okay, well, once you come back on after and that's, that, and that's, an not, even, that's not even that's not even so uh, that's not even our that's not even our. So what happened was as a result. And I can't understand why, because it's such a bad decision by the VDH executive board, whoever the president of the VDH is right now. They actually went after the SV because the SV said, hey, we are also a monopoly on German shepherds and we can't behave and abuse our monopoly power. So the SV tried to do the right thing by saying, OK, we've got to recognize pedigrees of our WSV members. Mm -hmm. we got to send judges to our WSV members. Otherwise, we're also complicit in these competition law violations and the vdh actually took the sv uh filed the lawsuit against the sv for uh, uh recognizing pedigrees of non-fci members and that is uh, and that is going to be <coughs> adjudicated i believe uh, at the end of this month actually in wow
Well, I guess you can so fight the, anything. It's not even, we're not even involved in that one, but that was kind wow. of a, one of the branches that, that that's one of the branches that, um, you know, kind of grew out of what we were doing. And um, it's, in, it's insane. It, mm. it actually is insane that, that we have to fight for this. We have to fight for a properly bred dog where you can prove the DNA, its lineage, its health, and all of that stuff. It, they don't want to recognize it because it's not within their network. You know, it wasn't born and the papers weren't issued within their network, which mm -hmm. actually has almost no control on breeding, as we discussed. Right. Wow. So that's the irony of it. It's insane. You know, where Completely. we have, where the SV has all the control on breeding of German Shepherds and WSV member follow that, mm -hmm. the people that are actually, you know, people want, they want to stop the SV from recognizing properly bred German Shepherds have no control. You know, so the FCI has no control over breed. And as, it, right. as you mentioned, anybody could breed anything. Yeah. Yeah. And register it with, any, with, with, with some kennel club. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. If you have a registration certificate, listen, if you have a registration certificate for a German Shepherd, it may have passed. It might mm -hmm. have passed away. But mm -hmm. let's say the kennel club, how would the kennel club know your dog passed away? It didn't pass away. Yeah. So your yellow lab breaks out of the kennel and breeds with a female German Shepherd. And now you register those puppies under the dead dog's name because they have no idea if he's dead or not. <laughs> and the female, right? Wow. And you're selling Yellow Lab uh, German Shepherd mixes of German Shepherds. Papered. Money. Wow. Because there's no proof required. There's no proof required of anything. <sighs> it's just, yep, I certify. <laughs> wow. That's insane. Well, listen, I want to, I want to talk oh, yeah. to you more, <clears throat> more about this stuff. I want to ask you, though, what's, what do you see? What are some new things going on with USCA? What's, what's coming up? I mean, I know there's a few years ago, there's a bunch of changes. There's some regulation changes with, I remember the stick hit thing. We're coming in and out. There was, they were talking about making the test harder and softer than Germany and, and all these things. What's new? What's some going the, some, on? So there's no, there's really, there's really, um, in terms of what's new, uh, in, in the working dog community, if you ask me, because now kind of like in a position that USCA is within WSV, I think we get the benefit of a lot of uh, early information and, and, you know, get to be a part of some of these decisions because of our, you know, focus on the German Shepherd and because of our focus on working dogs and, you know, what I said Schutzen is in our name, is that we want to make sure that the German Shepherd is displayed in its proper temperament and we want to make sure that when the dog is out on the field, you see power, you see, uh, you know, see teamwork. What we don't want to see, and this is what's coming, and um, uh, you're going to see a lot of focus now um, because of some things that transpired around the world. You're going to see a lot of focus, not just because of that, but uh, you're going to see a lot of focus on um, judging uh, pressure, you know, dogs that look pressured. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the, w whether it's on the track, whether it's in obedience, you're going to start to see a lot more focus around the world by, uh, you know, puni ju judges punishing uh, pressure because Good. we want to, we want to put the best, you know, we want to, we want to, we want to have dogs that show power, that show that willingness to work, that show that, that attitude, that, you know, that drive. And, uh, I'm not saying that, you know, it's, it's still a German shepherd. They're, they're a strong animal. They're, you know, they have a lot of, uh, they have a lot of power and, um, you know, I'm not talking, you know, m you know, all positive reinforcement type stuff. I mean, there's some negative reinforcement, but, but, uh, you know, of course you can, you can, you know, as uh, I think Gunter Deagle said it, maybe uh, I'm paraphrasing at this point is that, you know, you can train, you could train with this negative reinforcement or what you call pressure or whatever, mm -hmm. but your dog cannot show pressure when it steps on the field. Right. So, you know, so you have to manage that, but, uh, and also you have to, you know, there's so much, there's so much information available to handlers right now for, you know, nice training, good training that, you know, from, you know, people that have achieved high, res you know, great results and, you know, their dogs look phenomenal on the field. Yeah, of course, dogs will make mistakes and things like that. But still, you know, I think that's one of the biggest things you see coming down the road is that pressure is going to be universally punished um, if we see it on the field. And you're saying pressure from the dog's perspective, showing that he's too pressured, that he's 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 not yeah, he's not showing pressure, good, yeah, not in a good spirit. Showing, yeah. Dog showing pressure, yeah. Doing exercises there, on the track, mm -hmm. and then you, you, so, but that that was kind of like you know you asked me some of the some of the things that are coming up, but that's yeah, that's a big that's a big thing in judging. That's a big thing, 
um, because that 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 will that will hopefully alter some of the um, and get people to come around to some of the more uh, uh, to, to to training methods that are conducive to showing dogs with power, showing dogs with uh, you know a lot of attitude, spirit, and you know explosiveness in, in various things. So it's um, I'm you know I that's a bit that's a bit, that's a big push. Uh, um, um, I think Henry Messler just recently came out with uh, with a with a letter about uh, you know just you know overall state of the state because German Shepherds still make up eighty percent of IGP dogs, Schutz and dogs around the world, give or take a few percent. But yeah, eighty mm. percent of all the dogs that do IGP around the world are German Shepherds. No. Oh. And do you see the sport growing? Do you see the sport kind of standing still right now? Um, well, COVID kind of put a damper on it a little bit. Um, right. Um, it's growing in some areas and not growing in others. I mean, I could tell you that for, for one reason or another, whether it's uh, urbanization of different countries and things like that, you know, it's very hard for people to maintain a dog that needs room, <laughs> like yeah. a German Shepherd, you know. You, so, I mean, for some people, they're used to it. You know, you, you know, you can live in a city with a German Shepherd, but then where do you go to track, mm -hmm. you know? Um, just things like that. So in some, in sometimes it's diminishing, but overall, it's it's been fairly constant for us in USA, even through COVID. Um, you know, our membership has remained pretty constant, and uh, we're fortunate to have these loyal members. And and you know, people were just you know now that we started the trials again up in the spring. You know, people, it was great to see numbers. We almost had a hundred entries at uh, you know our working dog championship, and it was it was awesome. Yeah. And I think uh, they're expecting. Um, even more entries, you know, for the world championships uh, in Spain this year. Um, and then the other thing, and I don't want to uh, gloss over because you asked me some of the newer things for USCA, you know, we're Please. completely um, revamped, we're completely revamped our, our database. And uh, one of those uh, big things, so you, what uh, people will see is we're going to have a trial center coming out where they'll be able to actually enter trial events and things like that. You'll be able to look up history of the dog. So it's kind of like a it's kind of like a mirror of what the SV has, their SV doc system. So pedigrees, you know, issuing pedigrees, uh, pedigrees, pre, uh, litter registrations. And now, uh, because of uh, some of the court rulings, the pedigrees actually have a lot of meaning because they are recognized throughout the world by every WSV member. Yeah. So uh, that that is uh, that has been an undertaking. And uh, uh, we're fortunate to have some good database people working on it right now. Um, and uh, that's uh, coming very, very shortly. Uh, the pedigree system is actually already being tried by the office, but the trial center and some of the other membership uh, portals uh, still just being worked on, but very close. A few months out or a year out, or what are you thinking? No, no, no. It's a few months out. No, a few months out. Oh, cool. Out. We're, 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 like in a, we're like in a red zone. Okay, good. <laughs> D-Day. Well, so as far as the future of, of Schutzen, do you think is, I know it's a hard sport, but, and you know, you're, look, you're a husband, you're a father. Um, it's hard. It's a hard sport. I mean, I, I dedicated hundreds and hundreds of hours to doing it. Um, if you're lucky to have a club near you, you still have hours of tracking and hours of obedience and, you know, and bite work and stuff like that. What's your best advice to people who, um, who, I mean, I get so many people who are interested in the sport, and I always say just go watch the sport for a month. Go without a dog for a month to a club and pretend you have a dog because it's, it's kind of, it's kind of you know, like watching grass grow when you're not working your dog, if you're not really into the sport. Yeah. What's your yeah. advice? Because you, know, you, you, I mean, you have responsibility with your family and your job. And your, what advice do you give I mean, it's a lot. It's a, it's a, it's a little bit. It's a little bit easier for me, and I'm not going to lie to you that it doesn't cause uh, some uh, conflict between my wife and I, because you know I travel for judging, I travel for USCA, and uh, you know I also compete myself and train my dog, and and uh, both of our kids are in college now, so it's a bit easier in that respect. But um, it's it's still my wife isn't into you know into training dogs or anything like that. She's just a normal person without that mm -hmm. dysfunction. <laughs> um, um, but I, I guess, you know, I, I guess, you know, what I would have for anybody that wants to do it is I, I think you're exactly, you know, you have to go out there and, uh, actually watch for a little bit exactly what it takes and you know, go with club members to tracking and see how much time it takes. Yeah. yeah. And just, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people just, you know, um, you gotta have realistic expectations too, and that, that, that fits your lifestyle. Yeah. Because if you want to be a casual trainer, just go out to the club and 
That would be a social friendly thing and just train your dog whenever you want to and not train your dog whenever you want to. Then your expectation probably is not you can go to the USCA Nationals and make the world team. Right. Type of thing. <laughs> or, you know, but you, but you can still compete at a regional level. You can mm -hmm. still compete at a club level and at your own speed. Mm -hmm. And that's really, and that's really, and that's really it. Some people really, really get the bug and they really become, um, these uh, you know these vacuums for information for training for things like that and yeah. and then there's a large percentage of our members just want to go out and have fun yeah a very large percentage of the people what you know actually very large percentage in the country of, of people that do this mm -hmm. want to just go out and have fun and title their dogs at their own leisure you know without any kind of pressure and things like that and have fun in the club social environment which is you know kind of circling back to this whole AWDF thing uh, yes no problem recognizing anything AWDF does as long as we're also recognized uh, because it, it's just suicidal to be to act otherwise. But then sure. it gives everybody in the country and 99 percent of our members, whether they're USCA members or they're AWDF members, 99 percent of them just want to go out and have this casual training thing, you know, social interaction with people, you know, common bond around working dogs. You know, it's kind of a, you know. We're not, you know, it's a, it's just a passion that you want to share with the, per, you know, with somebody, and it does, your passion doesn't have to be going to the nationals or, you know, going to the world championship. It's just going out and training your dog. Yeah, and just have fun with it. And seeing, like you said, like you said, you get joy of watching your lab, uh, you know, do certain things because yeah. you see like the the beauty in the breed. And you know, I have the same thing with my yellow lab. Sometimes he sits in front of me with kitchen utensils or a towel, and he has no <laughs> idea why he's holding it in front of me. Right. Right. But, uh, but, you know, it's a, a lot of people are like that. They just want to see their, you know, like the dog, the German Shepherd that they have, do some working things and fun, obedience stuff and track and protection. You know, everybody loves bite work and things like that. Yeah. And I, I want to see more people get involved in that way. But the only way to really do it is to go experience it in the clubs, you yeah. know, and, and, if you, and don't lie to yourself. Be realistic. You know, if you work. 60 70 hours a week or 80 mm -hmm. hours a week it's going to be very difficult for you to achieve the high level of training that you want to do or something like yeah. that unless you really are yeah no, it's really insomniac or something. and you gotta have the right dog too i mean that's the other thing it's it's um, not gonna just happen yeah i think frank mentioned to you in his uh in his interview that you did and if, you know we always say that and actually jim jim ward is the one that uh, that said it to me way back when when i didn't have a nice you know good dog for the level that i wanted to attain jim said to me but if you want to be in a formula one race you gotta have a formula one car yeah yeah people and then you recognize also be, that yeah and then of course you have to have a formula one a formula one driver and, and then mechanic. you have to have a formula one crew around you right <laughs> that's true well, I mean, look, I would love to see the sport grow. I love the sport. I haven't done it in years with my dogs, but I mean, I was into it. I loved it. I titled my dog. And um, I think it's a it's an amazing sport. It forms a great bond. It's The dogs love doing it. Um, I wish more people would get involved in it. I wish the sport would grow more. I wish, you know, I wish we'd get more good helpers because I think that's another thing that's really lacking in the sport too is getting people who can really work dogs in the sport. Yeah. No, I agree. And, you know, really, it's a it's a being a good helper is a craft that you should learn sure. from somebody that uh, that is a good helper already and has uh, has made a lot of mistakes and knows how to read dogs. And, yeah, you know, it's not it's a lot more than just wearing a sleeve and taking bites. Right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You can screw up a lot of good dogs that way. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I know I know in the area you are, too, Robert, it's very difficult because you're in Southern California. Yeah. So, you know, good luck finding tracking in Southern Cali. It's impossible. I'll tell you something. Um, I think, and I talked with Danny Craig about this, you know, we both came up with this, this issue that a lot of times you're tracking these dogs in dirt or, you know, or areas that have been sprayed and it's very dangerous to the dog, you know, back in Kentucky and Tennessee and, you know, up where you are in New Hampshire, you know, it's nice grass. You guys, you guys have actually really nice green grass. All we have here is just my dog sneezing. Um, you know, we, we have yeah. dirt and, and the dirt, a lot of times I've tracked on dirt and I looked and a day later, there's a, there's a you know, crop duster dusting it. I'm thinking, oh, geez, what did I just do to my dog? To my dog, yeah. You know, and so. It, that, that's, that's, actually, that's actually one of the biggest problems for people that live around where you live or, uh, you know, in some other, you know, around other urban areas is finding tracking. Yeah, it's But really it doesn't hard. mean you can't do this. It doesn't mean you can't do the sport. <laughs> Because well, that's the great thing. Yeah, so that's the that's an awesome thing. I want to uh, in closing here. I want to talk about that because 
Um, what I didn't do any more tracking with my dog, I still was able to put the UPR2 on him. And then, you know, you can do the, you can do just tracking, you can do just protection, you can do just obedience, right? I mean, it's all out yep. there for people. Yep. Let's say you have a really nice German Shepherd, you just want to do obedience with them, or you just want to do obedience and protection. Those are all, all really v very meaningful all titles, right? And very fun to do. Yep. Or you can just do tracking. If you Not just have course. tracking around you and you don't have any helpers, you have bad helpers. Yeah, we're bad helpers, yeah. <laughs> um, no, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's definitely, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a love thing, and I can't describe yeah. it to, you know, it's a, you know, some people say it's a lifestyle. I mean, it's, 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 it's more than that. Yeah, no, you know, I love the German Shepherd. You know, I love the German Shepherd. I love, you know, I love the, you know, the breed test that was developed over time. You know, and it's now called IGP. You mm -hmm. know, that's part of the reason I became a judge, so I could put my own little itty bitty stamp on, on you know, the breed too. Um, you know what I, you know, as a judge, you know, and yeah. I think, um, I think, um, I think that the more, you know, I wish I had the secret sauce for how to get more people involved. But when you describe yeah. to some people everything that it takes to title a dog, you know. Scares them off. It's kind of like, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's, it's a, it's a, you know, you. I think you said it right. You know, before you want to, you know, before you want to take this seriously and go get a dog, you know, working dog that, you know, is that they need to work. They need to do yeah. things. Other, yeah. Otherwise, they they get dis destructive. Yeah. If you get a yeah. working dog, uh, a German Shepherd, properly bred German Shepherd, I'll say. Yeah. Um, if you get a properly bred German Shepherd, you know, you kind of made a commitment. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, any working dog. I mean, my wife's got a, a, a yellow uh, a working line lab, and she's out constantly training the dog. I hardly see her anymore. But it's, you know, it's, it's one of those. And I said to her, I said, listen, I'm going to get even with you when I get my Malinois, because, you know, my next dog, because I'm going to be out a lot, too. So yeah. she's kind of got free reign right now, but it's going to all come back in spades when I get my dog. <laughs> No, it's, yeah, you, yeah, so it's, it's, you know, I wish, I, you know, I'm always, I always welcome any ideas about how to grow things and, and you know, it's just uh, uh, and maybe and maybe part and maybe part of growth is being more public, but sometimes being more public can be a double edged sword too. Well, I mean, I think the only time it's a double edged sword is when you have you know like nutcase people who don't understand dogs and what it takes to train and what it takes, what it takes really to give the dog what it was made to do. And so many people yep. get these dogs and try to you know anthropomorphize the dog and and have it living in a home and you know wearing a wearing pajamas you know it's it's these dogs are made to work they're made to bite they're made to to track and 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 putting all that into the dog actually makes in my opinion i think you'll agree with me a safer healthier and happier dog you and i you and i know that and communicating that to a bigger public audience is always a big challenge because nice. you know we can be as cavalier as we want you mm -hmm. and i and people on Social media can be as cavalier as we want about stick hits and things like that, which I think are, you know, an important part of the test yeah. uh, right now. But you can't explain to a normal person why we hit the dog with a stick. Right. Well, I mean, look. Think about that. Yeah, but, but I'll tell you, that what people don't understand, I, I've used the stick in two different ways. I used to run a program at the shelters. I don't know if you, if you know that, but, you know, I would use the soft stick and, the, and I would use a clatter stick as well. But I would use the soft stick to startle the dogs. My idea was these dogs were about to fight or they were about to tee up or something and I'd whack them on the, on mm. the snout with a, with a soft stick. Now, yep. what I did right after that is I took my dog out and I put him on a sleeve and I'd whack him as he was on the set. And I said, do you notice that my dog does not flinch one time when he's getting hit with a stick, but any other dog, when I tap him with that stick, they, they, they flinch and they turn around, which gives me that time to correct them. And then I would, you know, take the mm -hmm. stick and I would hit myself as hard as I possibly could. Or I'd hand it to somebody and just say, hit me as hard as you can with the stick. And it showed that it, the stick hit isn't really what people think it is. It's not a stick hit. It's a pressure that the dog has to withstand to show his temperament, right? I mean, but... Absolutely. absolutely. It, I'm just talking about, you know, like when you have access to a person where you can explain it, it's mm -hmm. great, and you can yeah. demonstrate. You know, I say here, take the stick, hit me as hard as you want. Hard right? as you want. But when somebody, but when somebody's just looking from, you know, somewhere in the stands or out in the yeah. distance or on t on TV on or YouTube. something like that, and that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Or, or yeah, YouTube. Yeah. 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 Or, well, look, this YouTube. is but my mission, and this is why I want to thank you for being on the show because my mission is to really expose people to the best a dog can be. That's my goal is to make the. You know, I, I spent twelve years in shelters trying to save as many dogs out of shelters from being unnecessarily killed for no reason. Um, and mm -hmm. now it's, you know, I want people to know about these great sports and things that, you know, 
that the sports are able to provide for the dog and, the, and that the dog is then able to provide for you as a much, much better pet, a healthier friend and you know, a more stable companion. Absolutely. I mean, this, this is, uh, you've, you've hit the nail on the head on this one. What this sport is, it is a breed test also. Yeah. It, it actually, um, you know, whether you like it or you don't like some parts of it, it actually, the actual training and how the dog handles the training getting up to the breed test, it's not about just a score. Mm -hmm. It's just how the dog has handled all the training to get to a certain level. That shows yeah. you, you know, what the animal is, what is in the genetics of the dog. It's beyond the phenotype now. You're actually now looking at the actual genetics of the dog. Mm -hmm. And that is the part where we can't lose the working breed to these umbrella kennel clubs because they don't care about any of this stuff. And if they did care about this stuff, then you would see the sport grow exponentially. But the, that's the fight, Robert, who really fight, is that we fight the fight where... You know, we're kind of, you know, screaming into a well mm -hmm. uh, or in our case, uh, you know, you know, it could be a black hole, might as well be sometimes into a black hole. You know, we're always like, oh, this pretest, you know, it's 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 awesome and it's a lot of fun, too, for you because your dog is doing something that shows off what it was bred for, you know, its genetic characteristics. And, you know, and and then you kind of almost sabotaged and I don't want to say sabotage, but I'll, I, I can't I'll think it. of another synonym right now by a bigger umbrella kennel club type of thing where they don't really give a crap about any of that stuff. They just want to register dogs and numbers. Well, we've already seen the say, damage well, that they I... do. Yeah. Right? We're, I mean, we've already I, seen I, the I... damage. It's horrible. Oh, yeah, I agree. I agree. How can you show me a working because... dog in a kennel club having a title, a phenotype title, a show title, and not having a working title? I mean, I just think it's BS. This is why I'm so behind... Um, you know, SV, US, USCA, because I think it's the only organization, and again, if anybody is watching, has another organization, you go, you're always welcome on my show, um, that you are taking the helm, and I want to personally thank you for it, for because I love, the do I love dogs, but also everybody else owes you a debt of gratitude to say that these are working dogs, yes, they should look a certain way, but they must, they must have the genetic components, the makeup, the constitution, and the temperament to be what they were originally bred to do so that these working dogs can go on. If not, it's, it's going to destroy working dogs gonna, as a whole. We're going to lose them. We're going to we lose, will them. lose them. And if we yeah. put, and if, and, if peop, and if people in charge of working dogs, Rottweilers, Malinois, Dobermans, Boxers, German Shepherds, Schnauzers, if people, singular focus is on numbers of registrations, and not yeah. actually on proper breeding, what a proper Schnauzer is, proper German Shepherd is, we're gonna lose the working breeds. So if we, if we keep putting, or if, if organizations keep putting their faith in the hands of people that only care about money and paper and, reg and registration numbers, you're gonna lose working breeds because that's mm -hmm. all they care about. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't think, I don't think anybody can say it better. I wanna end it on that because I, I want people to think okay. about what you just said. We're, we're, we're at the cusp of losing working dogs, one of the most amazing animals in the world, because of greed. To be continued, man, to be continued. Yep. Thank you so much for what you've done, Vadim. Seriously, you've done a lot for the organization. You've done a lot for German Shepherds. Um, people who don't know, I'm telling you, you're a hero to the breed and thank you for it. I hope you, I hope you continue. I hope you continue to this fight, you know, because I think it's an important fight. I hope the sport grows and, um, and, and thank you from, from, from the bottom of my heart, from the dogs that you're helping and from the people that you're helping. It's my pleasure. Come back on. Thank soon, you, man. Robert, for, thank you, Robert, for inviting me. Yeah. You'll be back soon. You'll be back soon.